So it's often said that you should look around and learn what you can from your smart neighbors. Singapore's got a smart neighbor in Japan. And what's interesting about Japan are its zoning laws. Uh, could those zoning laws actually be brought over here as well? And can we actually learn something from it? Hi, I'm Ryan Ong from Stacked Homes. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, today we're going to talk about a place that many Singaporeans love visiting, that's Japan. And one of the things that we've heard a lot about are zoning laws in Japan and about how maybe we should take a look at implementing some of those smart ideas here. But what are they exactly? Well, we're going to go into that. Do visit our Stacked Homes editorial for a more concise breakdown and for more details. But in the meantime, here are the main things to know. So it's no surprise that space constraints are a pretty major factor in Singapore. This is a small island. And Japan, while it's admittedly bigger than us, Japan often has the same issues as well, right? Because most of their country consists of islands. So that is something that we have in common dealing with these space constraints. And as Singapore's population grows, we are also seeking to decentralize to move out from just having everything within the CBD. It could be an interesting time to start looking at our zoning laws and uh, probably how we can implement a little bit more flexibility in there. And that may be uh, something that we can pick up from our not so far away neighbors. So in Singapore, zoning laws tend to be fairly strict and well-defined. Uh, we have about 31 types. Uh, you can see more details of that on the editorial. Uh, the categories are very specific. Residential with first story commercial, for example, is different from just residential space. Business zones can be business park, uh, business park sort of white space, it can be a B1 business space, B2 business space, and so forth. The zoning laws are very, very tightly well defined. Appeals can always be made, of course, but in our experience, uh, URA is quite strict with zoning. It is, for the most part, futile to try and request turning your landed home into a shop here or uh, to try and build a house on a plot zone for a commercial property. Uh, it's very unlikely to happen for you. And all of this uh, might be stemming from you know earlier days when this sort of uh, very close management was quite vital. Our initial urban planning was not very sufficient. It was a little bit haphazard, so much so that in 1962, in fact, uh, the United Nations actually helped us to formulate the state and city planning project, the SCP, to ensure proper housing and to support employment. Uh, we've come a pretty long way since then. Before that, Singapore was a little bit of a sprawling mess, which also made uh, public transport and work a uh, pretty major headache. You can ask your grandparents or great-grandparents if they're still around. Uh, many might remember sometimes some people were faced with as much as hour-long walks to work. So the SCP for 1971 that set the tone for subsequent master plans for many decades to come, although we took over the reins and we started doing it our own way. But that was a plan for a small population in a different age. You can see that URA's plans have actually evolved quite a lot with time and today's master plan has grown more flexible. And one of the ongoing objectives that we've seen is a gradual decentralization. To oversimplify it a little bit, this broadly just means we don't want to over-concentrate all the major commercial interests and with them all the major amenities just in one place like in the CBD and the orchard, right? Doing so will disincentivize homes in fringe areas like Changi, Jurong, Woodlands. If there was nothing there and everything was in the CBD, almost nobody would, would want to go for a fringe area home except it's a very last resort. And on top of that, our transport infrastructure really can't handle this if our population keeps growing. We mean that both in terms of public transport like buses and MRT stations, uh, as well as roads if you have a car. It's bad enough now, you've seen it with everyone crowding to get in and out of the CBD at rush hour. Imagine that in a decade when the population number goes up. So with decentralization, it can mean uh, even very far-flung neighborhoods can form hubs or enclaves of their own. Uh, heartland areas can have their own major malls, major workplaces, schools, and so forth. And you may be in a situation where you don't need to travel far out of your neighborhood for what you want. We have seen this already happening in some regional hubs, uh, most obviously in the Jurong area, which used to be almost all industrial. Today you can see it's a retail powerhouse as well. And that's why we might be able to pick up some flexibility from Japan there. Japan has 12 different zones with some broad similarities to what we see in Singapore. Uh, the key difference is that Japan allows for maximum use of certain developments rather than outright specifying what gets built where. So even the more strict zones, for example, 
can allow for some home-based businesses and some small local shops. For example, you have a low density zone that might allow for a certain maximum number of stores and schools and that maximum number is based on the likely level of noise and traffic and so forth. So it could mean for example that this area could hold purely residential units that might happen or it might have residential units and then you find two stores there or you might find residential units and a school in the area whatever the local population feels that they need. A higher density zone even though it's zoned residential might have a higher tolerance for more shops, schools, other commercial interests. Again, that doesn't mean the government will force the construction of these things. It doesn't dictate that uh, outright all the time. It may all well end up being purely commercial anyway, even if uh, there are some commercial spaces available. So on our video here, if you watch from uh, minute 455 onwards, uh, you'll see that what is classified as an industrial zone uh, looks almost like a like a heavily residential one uh, and that happens out of the flexibility that they have but by setting a maximum use based on this amenity uh, nuisances like noise and so forth it allows for neighborhoods to develop in a much more organic way it allows for amenities that are not too disruptive such as small grocers small clinic small private clinic you know to spring up anywhere where it is practical or needed. And also in practice, urban planners aren't so precise as to correctly determine which is going to be the best exact corner for uh, a small mini mart or a small dental clinic and so forth. All of this also helps to promote more free market development. For example, if some amenities are needed within a residential area, the developers are free to buy over space from other residents, put up commercial properties there insofar as they keep within the maximum limits. Uh, right now in Singapore, this doesn't happen without a zoning change. So our urban planners are sort of micromanaging things to uh, an incredible degree, in fact. Japan's approach is also very good for uh, ideals such as decentralization. Japan doesn't impose one type of specific uh, development for a zone, as we've mentioned. Uh, mixed use is always part and parcel of the equation. If an area is zoned for a large office building, a certain amount of space can also be taken up by the office. The remaining space can be given over to other uses such as residential. In essence, this prevents the creation of land plots that are purely given over to just one purpose. So that complements the drive toward decentralization because it ensures each individual neighborhood will have its own very organic mix of shops, offices, and residential properties. Right now, Singapore has decentralized. To be clear, we have created new business hubs. Paya Lebar Quarter, Changi Business Park, One North, and so forth. Uh, these already follow the theme of uh, having uh, different developments within the same area. We are blending retail, work, and residential, what many developers uh, also like to refer to as a work live play sort of concept. So a change to a more flexible zoning system we think would match that intent while removing the need for our urban planners to absolutely have to use that crystal ball and dictate Okay, exactly how much space for shops, exactly how much space for offices and so forth. Also, as an interesting aside, Japan doesn't control whether uh, any of the residences built are uh, detached houses, condominium complexes, apartments. Residential can refer to any loose mix of any of these types. So that concept is probably going to be a little bit shocking to Singaporeans. We like uh, pretty neat definitions and controls that we like knowing Okay, that's a landed enclave there, that's a group of flats there, that's a group of private condos. Uh, th this idea of being loose and letting developers build what they feel is appropriate, uh, that could come as a, a little bit of a shock, but it does have certain benefits. For example, it could see over time neighborhoods reconfigure themselves into apartments to deal with a denser population, or it could see you know, neighborhoods spread out into landed homes or boutique condos as the population thins out and so forth. So this could help to mitigate, although not totally remove, the entrenchment of certain areas as being purely affluent landed housing or from turning it into a lot of vacant apartments, units and flat units if at some point the population starts to thin out in the area. But of course, this doesn't mean that uh, it's not open to debate and discussion. Certainly, uh, we know that some home buyers have expressed that hey, I wouldn't be so happy about a minimart operator opening up next door. And of course, for those who buy condos, uh, common worry is, hey, I don't want another condo building to suddenly spring up in front of mine and then block that view that I paid so much for. So this flexibility might actually make planning a little bit harder on buyers. 
uh, as they become less clear on what exactly is going to surround their property in the future. Of course, some people may also say, well, is the government obliged to consider such interests, right? Because the priority of bodies like URA and so forth should be the well-being of the whole neighbourhood or the whole city, not the capital appreciation of a specific person's condo. So an interesting topic with a lot of room for discussion. Uh, do let us know your thoughts, do post in the comments uh, or post your questions below. Let us know what you feel about it. And of course, do let us know what you'd like us to talk about next as well. Uh, we'd very much appreciate a like and a subscribe that will allow us to give you a notification whenever we post something new. And for a more concise breakdown of all these figures, you can visit the Stacked Homes article on the Stacked Homes website. Once again, I'm Ryan Ong from Stacked Homes. Thanks for joining me here today. Mm -hmm.